Welcome to Faith Bible Church. And I'd like to say to all the moms out there, Happy Mother's Day. And that's not only to biological mothers, but mothers at heart. Because any woman who is barren, but has a love for a child, or nurtures a student, also has the mother that deserves thanks and appreciation for your contribution to make this a better world. God bless you. And in tribute of Mother's Day, I have a little poem here to share with you to get us started. It's called Her Day. It's anonymous, so we don't know the author. She cooked the breakfast first of all, washed the cups and plates, dressed the children, and made sure stockings all had mates. Combed their heads and made their beds, sent them out to play, gathered up their motley toys, put some books away, dusted chairs and mopped the stairs, ironed an hour or two, baked a jar of cookies and a pie, then made a stew. The telephone rang constantly. The doorbell did the same. A youngster fell and stubbed his toe, and then the laundry came. She picked up blocks and mended socks, and then she polished up the stove. She washed the sills and paid some bills and put supper on for her drove. When her husband came at six, he said, I envy you. It must be nice to sit at home without a thing to do. Well, I can almost hear you laughing. Mothering is a big job, and it's one that deserves our praise and our thanks. Someone said, parenting is like being a juggler, except all the balls are screaming. <laughs> Here's a mother's prayer. Lord, give me patience when wee hands tug at me with their small demands. Give me gentle and smiling eyes. Keep my lips from hasty replies. Let not weariness, confusion, or noise obscure my vision of life's fleeting joys. So when in years to come my house is still, no bitter memories its rooms may fill. Amen. I have fond memories of many people who influenced me, my mother, and I'm thinking of a seventh grade science teacher that had no children, but she treated me like I was one of her own. Those kinds of people make a difference in the world. So, happy Mother's Day. Well, today we're going to talk about what it is to be faithful. We as Christians ought to be faithful people. And we need a real-life illustration of what a faithful person looks like. Well, the Bible gives us several, and we're going to look at two of those today in the life of Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh. In these two lives, we have an illustration of what it is to be a faithful believer in the Lord. I've entitled our message today, We Are Faithful. And our passage of study is in Numbers chapter 14, verses 24 through 45. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to open up and follow along with me. In the book of Numbers, in chapter 14, beginning in verse 24. And here's the story of the children of Israel on their way out of Egypt, their way into the promised land, and some of the people are unfaithful and some are faithful. In particular, we're going to look at the faithful examples of Joshua and Caleb. But my servant, Caleb, because he has had a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. Now, the Amalekites and the Canaanites live in the valleys. Turn tomorrow and set out to the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. The Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, 
Just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses will fall in this wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number, from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Surely you shall not come into the land in which I swore to settle you, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Your children, however, whom you said would become prey, I will bring them in, and they will know the land which you have rejected. But as for you, your corpses will fall in this wilderness. Your sons shall be shepherds for forty years in the wilderness, and they will suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpses lie in the wilderness. According to the number of days which you spied out the land, forty days, for every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even forty years, and you will know my opposition. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this I will do to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be destroyed, and there they will die. As for the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, and who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing out a bad report concerning the land, even those men who brought out this very bad report of the land died by a plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh remained alive out of those men who spied out the land. When Moses spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people mourned greatly. In the morning, however, they rose up early and went up to the ridge of the hill country, saying, Here we are. We have indeed sinned, but we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised. But Moses said, Why then are you transgressing the commandment of the Lord when it will not succeed? Do not go up, or you will be struck down before your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites will be there in front of you, and you will fall by the sword, inasmuch as you have turned back from following the Lord, and the Lord will not be with you. But they went up heedlessly to the ridge of the hill country. Neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses left the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and struck them, and beat them down as far as Horma. This is the end of our reading today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, give us grace to accept the things that we cannot change. Give us courage to change the things that we can. And give us wisdom to know the difference. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Last time we talked about what made so many people who were headed for the promised land unfaithful and unable to actually enter into God's rest. They grumbled when their enemy pursued them at the Red Sea. They complained that they wouldn't have enough water to drink and water to give to their flocks and their herds at Marah. They complained they wouldn't have enough to eat in the wilderness of Zin. When God gave them manna and quail miraculously, they tried to gather more than their fair share. And they complained. When God told them not to gather on one day of the week in order to rest and worship him, they tried to hoard food anyway. When they were afraid of running out of water again, they grumbled against God's chosen leaders at Rephidim. When Moses went to talk to God, they grew impatient and made a false god and began to sin against each other at Horeb. When they got tired of having to eat manna, a rabble among them rose up and complained. They wanted to go back to Egypt to enjoy fish and cucumbers, melons, onions, and garlic all the variety of spicy foods they missed because their greed led them to think of this pilgrimage as adversity. When God tried to keep them from leaving camp at Tabera with a ring of fire, 
they began to complain one family to another. At Kadesh, the unfaithful spies doubted that God would protect them from the giants of Canaan. When Joshua and Caleb tried to compel the unfaithful leaders and their tribes to trust God and proceed into the promised land, they picked up stones and tried to kill Joshua and Caleb. So, the unfaithfulness of the majority was manifested in quarreling, complaining, grumbling, doubting, greed, discontent, impatience, fear, and a little name-calling, too. That doesn't sound too much different than what's happening right now. We'll get back to the problem of grumbling in a bit. Right now, let's look at the three characteristics of faithfulness. Our heroes of the story, Joshua and Caleb, will be our teachers today. Number one, a faithful believer loves God and loves other people too. What did Joshua and Caleb do when they realized so many people were going to die if they rebelled against God? They tore their clothes. They spoke to the people and tried to persuade them to follow God's instructions. And they prayed for them. Tearing your clothes in the Hebrew custom was a sign of mourning. When was the last time you mourned over someone that is straying away from God? God's servants were not only concerned about pleasing God themselves, they were concerned about the future lives of those that were about to go off in a dangerous direction. Indeed, if the rebels did not turn around and start following God faithfully, they would die. Number two, a faithful believer obeys God and loves to obey him. Jericho, where the spies had observed the fortified walls around the city of Canaan, looked to be virtually impossible to conquer. But that didn't stop Joshua and Caleb from obeying God anyway. Faith sees what our physical eyes do not. Remember Elisha? He didn't know how well he was protected until God allowed him to see the invisible army that surrounded him in the hills of Canaan. God's army is bigger and stronger than the enemy when you're obeying God and loving him. 1 John 5, verses 1 to 3 reads, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Have God's commandments become a burden to you? Do you think God's commands got burdensome to the unfaithful children of Israel when they decided to choose a leader to take them back to Egypt? And number three, a faithful believer is distinguished by shining their light and not by complaining. Jesus said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's from Matthew 5, verse 16. The Apostle Paul said, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. That's from Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 15. I've heard the president called names. I've heard the governor called names. What do you think? Is that shining your light 
or is that grumbling? If you have a problem with someone, why don't you talk to them instead of calling them names behind their back? I wrote a letter to the governor. You see, I'm concerned that the longer this crisis goes on, with fear spreading, isolation being required, stay-at-home orders being extended, with job losses and general anxiety escalating in our communities, people are having some very unhealthy responses. The church is the one place that we can hear the truth of the Bible taught. It's where we can share our burdens and our prayers. It's the place that Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against. It's a place of healing, of caring for one another, of worshiping God together. Forbidding people to come to church only leads to unhealthy fallout, like depression, suicide, divorce, domestic violence, debt, and the, the denial that God has the answers to life's greatest struggles. So, I wrote a letter to our governor, and I asked, if we practice good hygiene and proper social distancing, can we resume meeting for church worship services on May the 17th? I am pleased to tell you that we are exempt from the executive order. We are now deemed a separate part of society, one which will no longer be held under penalty of law and free to meet for worship because of our status as a religious group. Praise God, we'll be able to meet soon. So, it is with great joy and anticipation that I announce that our reopening will be next Sunday, May 17th. We will only be having our regular morning worship time, but it's a start. We will be practicing the recommended safety guidelines by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Prevention, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And that means we will be practicing the six-foot distancing between individuals of different households. Face masks will be made available to any who don't have one. Hand sanitizing stations will be set up in the east and the west foyers. In short, we will do everything possible to maintain a safe and healthy environment, keeping within legal requirements, and slowly returning to meaningful and edifying worship at Faith Bible Church. We are one of many small churches that are doing the same. Some larger churches are waiting a while, being unable to comply with the six-foot rule. I have been in touch with area pastors, and like many, feel that the sooner we bring the Lord into this equation of handling stress and guiding us forward, the better off we will be as individuals and as a nation. Deacons will be contacting all of their care group members to share details of our reopening. Also, our website will be a good place to view the bulletin, get updates, and to learn the latest in scheduling. Meanwhile, love God and others. Obey God's instructions. And we, sh we should not complain. Loving God and others. It's a good time to show people how you love them. And they really need it too right now. Obey God's instructions. Pray for the kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is a good and acceptable. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. That's 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 3. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praises of those who do right. That's 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 14. Instead of grumbling and complaining, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. That's a quote from 1 Peter 2.17. In review, 
We are called to be faithful. What does it mean to be faithful? As we look at the lives of these real men who are real examples of faithfulness, it means to love God and to love others. It means to obey God's instructions and to love His commands. It means we don't have a right to argue and dispute and complain when we have so much to be thankful for. Think about that. Do not give up. Be faithful. Do not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Thank you, God, for the eternal hope we have through Jesus Christ our Lord. Save us from our doubt, from our fears, and from our sins. We praise the Lord, whose words bring us faith to believe what we cannot see and to do what we could not do alone. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to leave you with this song entitled, The People of God. Let us sing one confession With our hearts told to one truth alone For he has re-raced our transgressions Claimed us and called us his own His very own With our lips, let us sing one confession. With our hearts, hold to one truth alone. For he has erased our transgressions, claimed us and called us his own, his very own. We're the people of God, called by His name, called from the dark and delivered from shame. One holy race, saints every one, because of the blood of Christ, Jesus the Son. We're the people of God, called by His name, called from the dark and delivered from shame. One holy race, saints every one, because of the blood of Christ, Jesus the Son.